So thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so this is a presentation of the Library and Information Student Section of the Washington Library Association. And we're talking today with Dr. Jennifer Douglas at the University of British Columbia about emotions and archives. So we're going to start with some um, pre-written questions that I came up with and then open it up if anyone else has anything they would like to ask. So for the first question, you've done incredible work exploring the personal and emotional side of archives and archivists. Can you talk about how you got started in that area? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I, I, um, I did my dissertation work on original order, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> um, really it was about about provenance and, or well it was about personal archives and just generally um, their arrangement and description and the treatment of personal archives and at the time when I started it I was really interested in um, I came from a literary studies background and I was really interested in what I was what I kind of thought were really kooky ideas about original order and um, the ability of original order to somehow convey um, you know some sort of deep um, deep information, deep connection, deep reflection of the past, and especially with personal archives of the of the individual. And so I was sort of thinking, um, I was I was interested in how archives are actually shaped, like that they don't just sort of, um, you know, this kind of uh, myth we have of natural accumulation and this sort of like self perpetuating thing that's it's natural and organic. And I wanted to look at how I wanted to look at a bunch of case studies and talk to archivists and just think about like what are the different um, actions and events and um, sort of shaping processes that happen. So in some ways what I was interested in at that point was in in almost like depersonalizing the, the archive. Um, I was really suspect of claims that were being made about the ability to um, you know sort of understand the like think about character and personality and um, anyway, I was, I was working on all of that and I was almost finished writing my dissertation, um, when I was, I was pregnant and I, um, my, my baby, my second daughter was stillborn and, um, yeah. it was a really, really just uh, like devastating experience, obviously. And when you are, um, when you are in academia, you are not, you don't feel usually, I, I mean, I certainly didn't, maybe this isn't true for everyone, but I did not feel like there was any room for me to stop working. Um, I remember writing a, a note to my advisor, like, oh, something really awful has happened. And, um, you know, I probably won't get this to you tomorrow, but maybe on Monday. <laughs> and, you know, like, like really crazy, right? Um, and, and my dissertation felt really stupid and it felt really meaningless. And um, also it was just really, really, really difficult to get any work done. And I hadn't been like, I hadn't been a super kind of online person, um, but what I found um, after, after my daughter died was that it was very hard to find people in, in real life that uh, I could talk to or that had been through the same things as me, that knew how I was feeling. But online, there was incredible support. And so um, I found myself sort of like lurking in these online communities for a little while. And then um, after a period of time, sort of starting to to participate in them. I started a blog, um, which was something that everybody in this community was sort of doing. And we, we kept blogs, we wrote, we, we, you know, we built up community across those spaces. And um, after, after a bit of time, I started to be really interested in, in the kind of memory work that was happening in those spaces. So after a little bit of time, sort of my my professional training was kind of kicking into what was what I was doing, you know, in my personal life. And I was thinking about the way that um, in the particular experience of pregnancy loss, um, there isn't a lot to remember. Um, and there isn't, there is a lot for the parent, I think, to remember, like you have these really profound, um, you have a really profound connection and, 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 and memory and a sense of, of what you've lost and, and who you've lost. 
um, but outwardly to other people, it's not a, it's not an apparent loss, right? Um, it's not easy for other people to remember that child. It's not as easy for other people to remember that child as it is for the parent because there's they didn't they didn't live outside the parent, right? Um, so I was I was thinking about the way all these all this kind of work um, that parents were doing in these in these online communities and and through their blogs was kind of a way of building up um, a, a, an archive uh, retro you know kind of like it wasn't an archive of of the child in that sense of it was commemorative but it was actually aspirational right it was sort of like a kind of projection in some ways and. Um, it was about creating a kind of present and a kind of future for someone that never, you know, never was in the present and never was going to be in the future. And so that was the first sort of thing I started to kind of just be paying attention and thinking along those lines and thinking about the kinds of memory work really that was happening in those spaces. Um, and then I, there was a, a conference um, in 2013, <clears throat> Um, about, it was the, the Association of Canadian Archivists and they were doing a, a conference on community archives. And I thought, I, you know, I need to get back in here. Like if you don't present things and you don't write things and you don't get out in the world, like I'm never gonna get a job, it's just gonna be terrible. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just try, try to talk about um, this idea about aspirational, um, aspirational grief archives. And um, so I did that at that conference and I thought it might be like just a one-off thing that I never wanted to talk about again. Um, but I've just kind of continued, continued working in sort of related areas. So it really, um, for me, it really has come from, um, yeah, from personal, from like a really deeply traumatic personal experience and there's times like where I really 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 wish I had never started talking about <laughs> about that and kind of like left my my personal life out of it but um it's also been I don't know I think all research is personal right I think um all the kinds of research that we do the things that we're interested in they it does come from from us right and who we are and, and what other things are going on in our lives so um, there's also some like advocacy work, I guess, in that of like thinking about what we define as research and, and what we think of as, um, as appropriate to sort of talk about in different spaces. But yeah, so, so that's where, that's where it all comes from, though, is from, um, from those experiences. Thank you so much. That was such a, <laughs> such an amazing answer. And I feel like they're, yeah, really really profound and I think we could kind of spend every you know so much time kind of talking through that so thank you for sharing with us and yeah, this kind I'll also of just maybe say actually just so that people know like mm -hmm. I know it's really uncomfortable um and maybe difficult for some people to to hear that too but if anybody wants to ask questions about like what are you like doing research that comes out of like personal trauma after it feel free to ask i'm happy to answer questions thank you thank you for, thank you for offering that so this next question kind of follows um but the, the end of what you're talking about of of making things more personal and mm -hmm. so i have that you know the traditional model of the archivist is characterized as politically neutral and emotionally detached from their archives is it difficult to try to I guess you'd say to take the profession in a different direction. And have you ever received any kind of pushback from your peers or your school or anything like that? It's not as difficult now as it was in the beginning. And so that first conference that I that I mentioned, um, that was actually really kind of terrible. Um, you know, I was in a, a session with um, two other papers and um, I'm trying to remember what the papers were about. One was about um, the September 11th um, online archive. And the other one was about the, um, I, can't, I can't remember what its, what its title is, but it's a project um, run out of the University of Manitoba and University of Winnipeg, I think together. And um, they're doing a sort of community archive, a database 
project related to um, missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada and to um, sex workers. And so, you know, it was kind of a, it was, I think it was, a, an, at that point, it was sort of, all of those topics were a little bit difficult, I think, in, a, in an archival conference. It wasn't the normal sort of um, fair. Um, but I did, I started out talking about my own experience and how I had, had sort of, because I, I haven't, I didn't, I couldn't find out a way, I couldn't, um, I couldn't figure out a way to start talking about the online communities and aspirational archives and all these ideas without sort of explaining how I'd, how I'd come into that. Um, so I think, I think the, the personal aspect of my paper was more um, difficult for people in the audience. And it was really, um, when I gave the paper, it was like totally dead quiet, like never, never have I given a paper where there was just like absolutely no sound. And since then I have, but um, it was just completely quiet and nobody asked me any questions. Um, so that was kind of, uh, yeah. And then like after the, after the paper, nobody came near me. Like it was just sort of like people were, were really, um, really backing off. And then um, maybe the second, maybe early on again, like I remember I, I um, had a poster at the I conference, um, which is like, I don't know if anybody's been to the I conference or looked at the proceedings, but it's a pretty like, it's not really a venue where people talk a lot about personal experience and it's actually not that um, archives are fairly, um, they're, they're maybe getting um, better represented over time, but they were not that well represented then either. And I had a, a poster that was like, I'm trying to remember what the title of it was like. It had grief in the title anyway. And you, that, you know, you had to stand at your poster for two two hour sessions and like not one single person stopped to talk to me. It was just like people would be coming in. It was like a wine thing too. Like people would have cocktails and stuff and they'd sort of like walk along with their glass of wine and kind of look at my poster and then just be like, you, you know, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else and talk to someone else. So, um, but then, you know, I think with... Um, with really this special issue that that uh, Marika helped um, uh, edit on affect and archives, um, which was right around the same time. We didn't uh, we didn't know each other then, and we weren't working together. Um, but uh, I heard sort of through I think through Anne Gilliland from another at a conference like, oh, you know, um, there's some students at UCLA who are working on this um, symposium on affect, and they're they're putting together. Um, a special issue. And so when that special issue came out in 2016, I think that sparked a lot of discussion. And um, that got people talking a lot more. And since, um, since that's like, so it's only five years, right? That was only five years ago. Um, but in that five years, it's definitely become a lot easier. Um, and a lot more, um, there's a lot more support, a lot more people who want to think about um, the emotional dimensions, the affective dimensions of, of doing archival work, of archival records, um, of working with people. Uh, there's still, I think, um, some pretty deep seated ideas about how personal you should be allowed to get when you are a researcher talking about your research. So I do definitely, um, I do definitely run into people who are sort of like, you sure you should be talking about this stuff? Or I've also done a lot of, um, I've, I've, I've used auto ethnographic methods as a way of thinking through a lot of, of questions related to archival work. And um, that's another one where people, sometimes people are like, that's not really a real thing right like it's not rigorous enough it's not it's not um it's too subjective so there there definitely is still I think some real some resistance to that um not necessarily the subject matter of emotions and archives um but the approach like if you're going to talk about your own emotions or your own experiences or you're going to use methods um, that are really focused like like autoethnography. So I guess that's kind of um, 
have I received pushback? I also like, it depends on where you are, right? Like if you look at the, if you look at the archival field, you can see there's people who are talking about, like if Michelle Caswell gave a really um, amazing keynote at, well, she's given lots of amazing keynotes. Um, she gave one at the uh, ACA conference last year where she talked about joy and anger, right? And the, um, the power of emotion to move us into action and the way that emotion is the key factor in how we know things, right? So um, the sort of um, the sort of uh, emotional basis of, of of what we know and how we act in the world, right? And how this can be really powerful, and we can use it for powerful ends. So, you know, in you have Marika's work on on um, on hate, for example, and how um, in, in her article on aligning bodies, right? We can think about how um, how hate can be a powerful emotion that can help us work in particular ways. Um, but then there are definitely pockets of the, of the profession and of the field that are more um, conservative too, right? So I think UBC, where, where I teach, is a very, um, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of kind of cutting edge work being done on digital preservation. Um, but some of the, the sort of overall kind of feel in the program is a little bit more like traditional in terms of kind of archival theory so there's you know there's tensions there's 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 tensions that arise um but within the and then i guess the other the other sorry i'm kind of going on and on but i guess the other um the other tension is sometimes between the profession and um and people who are like working as researchers and educators, right? Where we can talk about anything we want. We can talk about all sorts of feelings and stuff, but then other people are like, yeah, but I'm like doing a job with a budget and a manager who wants me to get this, 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 and this done, right? So there's also, I think there's, you know, there's differences between, um, between uh, the, the profession and the academy and within the professional um, field too. Yeah, I think we're gonna we'll come back to some of that stuff with the, the culture later on, but thank you for sharing that. So this is a bit of a loaded question, but do you think a more empathetic approach makes people better archivists? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, Just yes, we can. <laughs> yeah, I mean. One of the things that I, I used to do this as an assignment in, um, I have a, a class that I teach on personal archives and I used to have people um, do an assignment where they sort of, I, I, I do a little bit of it, like a similar kind of assignment now in my arrangement and description class, but where you work on your own phone, your own records. And um, in the in the personal archives class, I did a bunch, in the, in the arrangement and description class, it's sort of like you figure out what your phone is and you, you describe it using descriptive standards. Um, the personal archives one was a little bit more reflective and, and asked sort of to think a lot more about like, how does, how do your records represent you and what aspects of your, your life or yourself are represented in your records and what aspects maybe aren't, um, you know, what does, what does leaving, you know, if you were leaving this behind, what would, what would it say about you? How would you feel about it? And, um, that was always a really good, um, it was a really good exercise for students to kind of experience being archived. Um, they, 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 they thought differently about like, they thought about things like, oh, uh, this whole, you know, this whole part of my life, which is so important to me, is not represented at all in my archives. Like maybe it's a relationship or maybe it's a, a, an activity or a hobby that produces no textual or photographic or whatever records, right? Like um, I'm thinking like I'm thinking about people who were, um, you know, there were people who were really um, uh, dancers who were, you know, dance was a huge important part of their life and how they saw themselves, but there was nothing in their phone, for example, that that reflected that. Or they would have really personal information and they'd think like, I don't want anybody to see this, right? What they'd realize when they were sort of working with their records was like, oh, I'm, I'm burning everything, right? Like I'm, I'm putting this all in a box and leaving instructions, like set it on fire without looking at it um, when I go. And that, so that, that activity always, I think, um, 
it, what students would comment on, there was a reflective piece at the end, and what students would comment on was how, how it just made them think about what it would feel like to be on the receiving end of archival work. And it's really, you think like, oh yeah, you would think about that anyway, but by the time they'd been through like five or six archives classes with us, um, they were thinking like archivists. They were really thinking like archivists, not thinking like um, the, the, the subjects of records, right? So yeah, I think that um, empathy is huge. And then the um, uh, something I, I, a couple of summer, two summers ago, I, I'm, I'm really behind on this project because of COVID mostly, but um, I interviewed archivists about the emotional dimensions of archival work. And I put out a call on listservs and stuff, and I thought maybe like 10 people would want to do it or something. But in the end, I interviewed 30 archivists. And um, the, the theme of empathy in the work came up constantly, like just constantly. Um, there was a really lovely story. There was this woman who was an archivist at a, a small, smallish community archives and sort of like kind, it, it, they take some objects as well. It's sort of like a bit of a museum archives kind of place. And she talked about some um, two donations that had been brought in that really weren't like, it really wasn't something that you would take. Like one was, um, you know, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember these. Maybe you've seen them like, <laughs> in your, I don't know, in an uncle's garage or something like that, but like velvet paintings, you used to be able to buy them at gas stations. They're, they're like just crazy hideous, right? Like, um, so this woman had brought in this velvet painting of the Last Supper. And, um, you know, this was like at a small community archives and, you know, where they're really like thinking about collecting stuff related to, to the area. Um, but the woman, the woman, her, it had, this um, painting had belonged to her best friend and her best friend had died quite recently and she was just devastated and she came in and she had a long talk with the archivist about her friend and about this painting was the only thing that she had of her but she felt that she, you know her life was important and um, yeah you know she wasn't super she, she wasn't really well known or anything like that but she didn't need to be forgotten and so this, this archivist was like, okay, you know, she filled out an accession form and she took the velvet painting and she's like, you know, we don't do much with it, but she doesn't care. She just wanted to know that someone, she wanted her experience recognized, right? She wanted her, um, her friend recognized. And, and this woman was like, it's no, it's no real problem to me to, to take this, this thing on. And I think that a lot of archivists, the first, and, and this isn't like a, a, a slam on archivists either, it's just how we're trained. Like a lot of us would have just been from the beginning, like, no, this is this isn't a this isn't archival, this isn't within our collecting policy. Um, no, right? But this this woman just kind of sat and listened, and she had another story about an older man who came in with a rock that he had been told by someone in his family was a very ancient potato fossil and it was really important to him that this rock be preserved because it was you know it was it was something that was important to him and she talked about she talked to him again she just had a chat with him and um she she learned through talking to him that he wasn't really um hadn't been in school for a long time like had had left school in you know, as a young teenager and um, worked in worked in farms. This was in a, in a farming community out in the valley and um, didn't really see himself as like someone who was would, would go to museums or have, you know, his, his, his it, it was a the museum was like a rarefied thing to him. Right. So even this little small community archives was for him to walk in with his artifact you know it was a, it was a really big deal and so again she was like okay fine you know fill out the accession register and now they have this she's like it's just a rock right like it's not a it's not a fossil it's a rock that this poor man has been carting around but now it it lives in the archives right and I, I, I really um 
I was really struck by those two stories. And even though I'm like, obviously archives can't go around accepting every velvet painting or rock that people want to give to them. It was just the way that she talked about listening and um, like being with the person and being with their story and, and thinking about like, not just what is like, what does this record mean to the archives, but what does this record mean to the person, right? What does this record mean to the person who, who, who has it and who wants to, um, who wants to donate it? And that really, those kinds of ideas, the people who responded to this call for interviews, they all, they all had stories that they wanted to talk about and that were really connected to um, the work with people that archivists do and the different types of relationships that they have with people and um, clearly hadn't felt a lot of other um, opportunities or spaces to talk about those things. So yes, I think that I think that empathy really does make a better archivist and I think that it's something that we need to work on and something that we haven't given enough space to. So I know <laughs> It's funny, you just reminded me, in Los Angeles, there is a velvet painting museum. So oh. there, I think it's, <laughs> or some kind of store, something dedicated to the, to the art. So it's not dead yet. Okay, good to know. <laughs> but thank you for both those examples. I think are really, I mean, you're right that, that we can't accept everything, but that is really, I think, really touching. So kind of getting back to the, to the archivist side of things, um, some of your work touches on secondary trauma that may be experienced by archivists working with difficult material. And in your opinion, how can archives foster a culture that promotes mental health for archivists? Yeah, um, so that I think the, the primary work, um, published work on secondary trauma that I'm associated with was um, uh, through my role as a supervisor to two students who did a directed research project with me, um, Jenny Vanderfluit and Katie Sloan. And so they put out this survey um, uh, on secondary trauma and an archivist, and they got a tremendous response, like, like a really high number of responses. And again, I think uh, it, it's a testament to how, um, how the professionals want to talk about this stuff now, right? Like there is a, there's a clear need to have some conversations. Um, so I definitely want to, I definitely want to make, um, be clear that, you know, Katie and Jenny did the, did the bulk of that um, work in, in kind of thinking about what to ask and, um, and how to put the survey out and collecting that information. So I think a couple of things that, um, that we noticed in in the survey, um, you know, I don't I don't really have any answers. I have a few ideas about things archivists can do um, to promote mental health for archivists, um, but I think some of the some of the issues are really structural. Um, there was a really clear link between uh, precarity and mental health issues because, um, and for a number of reasons, one. Um, you know, temporary contract workers often didn't have access to benefits. So in Canada, we have typically like a, 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 I don't know if it's a better benefit system, but we have a more equitable benefit system. Um, sometimes I think, you know, depending on your employer, you will have better, you may have better access or more access. Um, but, but that's not the same for temporary contract workers who often don't have access to healthcare benefits. And so one of the one of the sort of glaring things in the survey that that Jenny and Katie put out was um, that that uh, workers people who are working in contracts were feeling that they did not have access to the same types of resources for mental health um, as people who were in permanent positions. And then you know you. Have have to go and think okay well who has temporary contracts it's usually students and new professionals right so there's um there's a clear issue there and then you think about like what kind of work gets done on those temporary contracts it's often arrangement and description work right we often um we often see that kind of temp uh, arrangement and description digitization of collections sort of parceled into projects given to new professionals on contract basis and that kind of material often 
uh, hasn't been really carefully vetted, you know, like um, a, a bunch of boxes, a bunch, a bunch of discs, a bunch of whatever came in and it's, it's sitting there waiting for somebody, maybe it's been sitting there for 30 years waiting for somebody to come and arrange and describe it. And a supervisor says, here you go, you know, have a look at this. And so, so we kind of, what we found in that survey too, is that it's very hard to predict what kind of records will be difficult for people, right? Um, depends on a lot of factors, depends on people's prior experiences. Um, so one, I think there's like, I think there's a key, a key issue here where we can see that some people are more vulnerable um, than others. Um, in terms of like promoting mental health, there were a couple of, of really interesting sort of, um, again, issues that kind of came up like, Many people who responded to the survey talked about how they had access to um, counseling services, but they were over over the phone. And so you would have to call on the phone in your work hours and they're like, you know, I work at like an open in an open office like I don't really want to sit at my desk and talk about how I'm experiencing this this trauma, this secondary trauma or whatever it is right and you know my my workmate is right next to me um so we've talked in the in the um you know there's a lot of really excellent work going on about trauma-informed archival practices meaning like um um how we work with uh, researchers or donors who may be experiencing trauma or who are trauma experienced. Um, Nicola Laurent and Michaela Hart and um, Kirsten Wright have done really excellent work on, on, on trauma-informed practices in, in Australia. Um, but some of the things that, that we've sort of highlighted as, as needs for, for researchers, like having a private space where, where you can you know, if you're a researcher working with difficult records, having a private space that you can take yourself away from, that kind of thing is, is I think, necessary um, in workspaces as well, right? So thinking about how workspaces are designed. But then the other thing that came up a lot in the interviews that I was doing was, again, structural, is that a lot of archivists are working by themselves, right? They work in an organization where they're the only archivist or one of a very small team. And so one of the things that was um, discussed frequently in those interviews was um, finding ways to bring, bring people together um, who are in different workspaces, right? So um, ideas were floated around of just like even like Facebook groups or, uh, you know, a Slack channel for, um, um, for archivists in different spaces. Um, right now, uh, Nicola Laurent um, is, and a bunch of other folks, again, are trying to start this kind of community of practice around trauma-informed archival work. And so there's, the, there's kind of a, an international effort um, to get, you know, some, a group of people together and, and talking. And I think that some of that is, is, is really, really important, is like finding ways finding um, channels and spaces where this kind of um, connection can happen because we are pretty isolated. I think we tend to be pretty isolated in our work. Do you think there's anything um, that schools can do to sort of prepare students for this kind of emotionally challenging work? Anything that, that could be taught in a classroom? Yeah, I think so. And I think um, one of the things I maybe should have said in the last answer too is just talking about this stuff is helpful, right? Like um, in 2016, I think it was, there was a session at the um, association, again, the ACA conference, and three, um, three people were presenting, Rebecca Sheffield, who at that time was working at the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Archives, which is now called the Archives, um, and Anna St. Ange, who works at York University in Toronto, and Melanie Delva, who was working for the um, Anglican Church and had been involved in the um, Truth and Reconciliation, the Anglican Church's response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. And um, they gave, they just, they did a, a, a series of talks about um, the sort of impact on themselves, especially um, of working with difficult subject area or difficult records. And um, the room was packed. 
And then at the end, they got a standing ovation. And like, I've never been at an archives conference where anybody, where there's been a standing ovation. Like, that just doesn't happen. Um, the one place where there is a standing ovation at an archives conference is every year the ACA students give a uh, do a symposium at UBC and at the end of that there's always a standing ovation but I think that's because everybody's a little bit scared of Luciana Durante and so there's a standing ovation at the end but this was like this one was um like just a real genuine holy cow kind of um moment and I th and it opened something up and then I think every conference since then there's sort of been at least one session where it's sort of like you know, people joke that it's kind of like archives therapy, but it it's needed, it's necessary, right? And um, so I think just like having having these conversations and acknowledging that this is part of the work is is also part of um, promoting archivist mental health, and that starts in the classroom. I think, right? We can we can start that in the classroom. Um, we we talk about in my and lots of in more than one class and at UBC now I think it's 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 becoming something that is, is more discussed um you know we talk about working with traumatic records um uh working with different types of difficult records in my class on personal archives we it's like probably one of the major themes of the course is just sort of like you're gonna have to work with people who are grieving or who are you know, sick or who are dying um, or who are incredibly angry or there's all sorts of things that could be going on, right? Um, you're going to work with records, you know, one of the, there's a case study that we do in that class that's really difficult, but it's also really related to something that is is very much a part of our um, so we, we do a case study where we talk about like uh, a university professor's archives where you find in those records um, evidence of uh, a potential um, a sexual assault. And, you know, that like that, like that's coming in archives, the Me Too, the Me Too of archives is coming, right? Like the amount of material that is in university archives um, that is is relevant in a Me Too context is huge. But if we don't talk about that stuff with students, if we just talk about like, you know, I don't know, nothing. We don't talk about the records. We hardly ever talk. We just are like, here, this is what the, this is what original order is. This is what the phone is. This is how you do this. But we don't talk about like, what are you going to see, right? Um, who are you going to talk to? Who are you going to work with? If we don't talk about that stuff, then we're setting students up for um, for feelings of 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 um, just being really unprepared, right? And that was a theme that came out in the inter in the interviews with archivists who mostly had been were mostly like mid career archivists, and they were like, one of the questions I asked was, "Did you ever talk about um, emotions? Was it part of your archival education?" And most every single one said no, and except for except for one very new um, recent graduate who had been in my class. Um, everyone said no and they all laughed like they were like <laughs> no no right like no we didn't talk about that um but but we are starting to talk about it and i think that's the biggest thing is is talking the other thing that i'm i'm trying to figure out how to do is is list is think about how to listen right like how do we teach students and that goes back to the empathy question but like what are ways that we what are ways that we can think about how we listen to stories, right? And how we listen to what people are trying to tell us and make space and time um, for that kind of listening and that kind of empathy. Um, I see the archival field increasingly focused on like efficiency and deliverables, um, uh, but we work with people, right? And and we hold people's stories. We hold, we hold on to people's like, we hold on to people's lives, right? We are a space of afterlives um, and that comes with a huge amount of responsibility. So that, I think that piece of like, that's not something I really have figured out, but how do we, I think that is a key piece that needs to be figured out is like, how do we, how do we think about listening? How do we, how do we build those kinds of skills? And probably we have to work with other professions who are better at this than we are like, or who have more experience, um, maybe social work, um, 
you know, maybe maybe we need to make some connections into other fields. There's a really great article. Um, it's published quite a while ago before before people were really talking about um, about these kinds of issues by Judith Etherton. Um, I can't remember the title of it. Um, Judith Etherton is the name of the author, and it was published in the um, Journal of the Society of Archivists, which is the British um, Association Journal. And she talks about working with social workers and and counselors and other health professionals. And it's it's really interesting um, to think about some of the um, some of the sort of cross um, crossover potential that we could have there that's still unexplored. I'm really glad that you brought over crossover potential because this is um, something that I'm curious about. Um, a lot of us are coming from a library perspective, and I know that libraries and archives have a lot in common with this sort of this kind of historic emphasis on neutrality, but also a lot of hidden emotions. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that libraries could adopt kind of a more care oriented perspective? I'm not sure how to answer that question because I am like a straight up archives person. I don't have an MLIS. You know, I went to UBC for my degree and we can, UBC has a, a master of archival studies, right? Like yeah. I never took a library course. I really don't, I like libraries. Um, I was at the, I said I was at the eye doctor this morning and the eye doctor was, he's, he's just was like, I don't like libraries. And I was like, what, how can you not like libraries? And then it turned out it's because he doesn't like to hold his head this way to look at the titles of the books. I was like, Okay, weird. Um, but anyway, I'm not so sure that I am a, a great person to answer that because I would I feel like I often and I think the archival profession in general, it kind of feels this way we often get grouchy when, um, you know, librarians or, or other folks kind of sweep in and, and try to tell us how we should be and what we should do. So I don't know, although I think, you know, I see, I sometimes hear the, the other way around that archives are behind libraries in this regard, partly because we just haven't thought of the archival profession as much of as a people oriented profession, right? We've tended to think about the records and not the people who come in. Um, we don't have spaces that are hospitable to people <laughs> generally, like the archives is not a place where you sort of wander in and think like, maybe I'll hang out. and and um, sit down for a little while, right? Like it's it's just not the same kind of space. So I think from in inside um, the archival field or the archival profession, we are a profession, we are all often given the impression that we are behind, um, that we are behind libraries and libraries are doing much more forward kind of thinking work than we are in this field. So- May I comment on something here? Sure. Sure. I, I am a, an archivist at a public library in Washington State. And from my perspective, um, we are required by, by the funding model we use, by the needs of our users to put people first. We are saving and preserving their histories. And one of the most difficult lessons that I <clears throat> had I went up to the University of, or to the Washington State University Archives, and they had a marvelous collection that I wanted to look at. And the archivist there taught me the most important thing I think I've ever gotten. And that was that because you hold an item does not mean you own it. That is their history. That is the, the source community has much more ownership of that item than you do, and, it, and it's our responsibility to represent that item in the way that the original um, community saw it. For example, I am a, take care of a collection of Native American photographs, and uh, we had volunteers come in to do the some of the labeling and cataloging and the um, pictures of women preparing for a uh, harvest festival that was a an important spiritual event for the local community uh, were labeled things like woman peeling potatoes. Mm -hmm. And the local community, of course, was offended. And we had no idea why we had no idea about it until we could sit down and talk 
So I, I think that that's very important that we tell their stories and we have to see their viewpoint. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. And I, I don't think, and you know, I can see some of, I can see some UBC students here. So they might, um, they might just nod or, or, or thumbs up or thumbs down. I'm not sure where, like, I'm not sure that that's necessarily how we teach in, in programs still. Um, if we teach about responsibility to people or we teach about responsibility to records. Um, so there, you know, the, the, I think that the long, a long standing tendency in the archival field has been to separate records from people in some key ways and focus on, on pre preserving the thing. Um, I, I would, I, I think there is a shift to thinking about people and stories um, and that shift should, should continue and should be strengthened is what I would like to see. Thank you. So that's actually, so in the chat we have people that I think want to kind of continue off what you're saying. Um, Louis had asked, off that point, do you think that emphasizing the emotional and personal aspect of archives could help change that attitude towards archives and that they would be like more, you know, more of a place that people might, I'm assuming, Bo, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like feel more comfortable um, kind of in more of that library vein and, and chase it at a similar thing if, if archives should be places like that. I think so. Um, I mean, I think there's like one of one of the one of the maybe tendencies in in outside of the literature on community archives, which is really different, um, the, a tendency in in archival literature, the, 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 the things that we used to teach with, is to is to sort of think of all records as um, as government records and as evidence of certain types of rights or privileges. Um, and a, a couple of years ago, I was invited to give like a really short talk at the at Library and Archives Canada about, it was as part of an event. And this was an argument that I made at the event was like, maybe we should stop focusing so much on, like when we're trying to um, connect to people, we're trying to, um, you know, bring new people into the archives or make people understand the importance of archives and support archives as a mission, right? So that we're not constantly struggling. Um, maybe, maybe accountability isn't the only thing we should be thinking about. Maybe we should be thinking about like the emotional side of archives, the connection that people have to archives. And I actually got quite a lot of pushback on that at that event. And I think people thought I was saying that we shouldn't worry about accountability anymore, that that was something that we didn't need to think about, and which isn't it at all, right? Like archives can be spaces for more than one thing. Um, they don't have to be just one, you know, just one thing or just another thing. And I do think that if, if people, if more people had more sense of the kinds of stories that are in archives, right? And, and as Terry was saying, the, the sort of responsibility um, that, ar that archival spaces have and that archivists who work with, with records have to, um, to carry these stories, right? To respect these stories and care for these stories. I do think we would, we, we would be understood differently and we um, would potentially have um, more people interested in our work and more support for our work, right? It does open up a lot of really tricky questions about like, what is archival material, right? And I, as an instructor and as a researcher, I like to be very open with that idea. Um, you know, I, I, I have been working on a research project with bereaved parents. I interviewed um, um, eight bereaved parents about records as part of their grief work and the kinds of things that they talked about were really not the kinds of things that we typically see in archives and they were also not things that realistically are probably ever going to end up in an archival repository right they're really personal materials and these are people who um you know they're not prominent people in their community there's, there's it's unlikely that their their stuff would ever go into a repository but then, you know, that raises all these questions about like, okay, well, like what stuff should be in a repository? Um, 
if we if we kind of expand the archival universe and we're thinking about people and stories and emotions like how we have a lot of work to do in um sort of like appraisal theory there right like thinking about okay what kind of stuff should be in an archives then right and whose stuff and who decides right and that's where community archives are, i think are so um interesting and um and kind of um just offer an, another model right of where uh it's 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 self-created right the a community decides like these are our records this is this is what we want saved this is how we want it represented this is what we want to do with it right um that's a really different ethos than than the sort of preservation from above kind of model that we see in mainstream archives right so um yeah yes yes i think there should be i think archives should be places like that and then i think that if we see that move we just have like a ton of work to do in in thinking in like reimagining those spaces right and and thinking about what they could be for what they could do so that's that's like one of my favorite things to think about is like what are records for what do records do in the world right and and for whom um yeah there's lots of stuff to think about there so much to think about so i think we have time for one more question if anybody wants to put anything in the chat or you can unmute and ask Dr. Douglas directly. If I may impose another time, I hear large blank silence sure. here. No, go for it. <laughs> Uh, in a multi-ethnic community, there are many voices, many stories, many communities, and one of the things that we struggle with are not only representing other communities appropriately, but there are, for example, the um, migrant workers that came into this agricultural valley in the 40s during the war years, the uh, Mexican-Americans now, and they were so busy working they were not saving, um, promoting themselves in the press or saving particular uh, mementos that they might pass into a repository. And so now we find that our repositories are very unbalanced, that they don't represent our, our whole community, but that there is a very active, prominent group that is very comfortable with the way our um, our records and our artifacts look. Do you see that there's any place for archivists or for archives to promote one community or another or to balance the collection? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good and really hard question. And I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not I'm kind of uncomfortable with um, like personally with the the thought of trying to balance a collection because i'm not even sure how like where does the who who just who decides what's balanced right and yeah um what's the measurement for a balanced collection um i think that the only i mean i think this is this is typical of of probably like outside of community archives again thinking about mainstream archives it's got to be typical of every archival repository across North America, right? Like we have um, in in Vancouver, where I live, you know, the there are a number of municipal or small like city archives, and it, not one of them is is balanced. In um, not one of them represents the community that exists or the community that was, right? They're one hundred percent almost 100% like white settler narrative um, in all of in all of these archives. And so and there's a lot of tension around like, how do we how what do we do about this problem like we recognize um, we recognize that there is an imbalance and um, and and what can we do about it and 
you know, there's a, like a, a, a cycle where I've heard people saying, well, we can't, you know, we, we want to like reach out, say, to the Chinese Canadian community or the um, Punjabi Canadian community or what, whatever, what, there's all sorts of different communities. Um, but when they, you know, when we, it, it, when people look at our archives, all they see is this white settler narrative, um, this kind of pioneer, like the very romantic kind of pioneer narrative. Um, so how, how can you, how do you bring other stories in, other experiences into that space that is already completely not reflective, right? That completely not representative. Um, and there's there's like a real paternalism that is inherent just in that gesture of like your stories should be here, right? Well, like why should your stories be here? You've never shown, <laughs> you know, this 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 archival repository has never shown that it is going to be a good steward for these stories, for these records, right? Um, so I'm not sure whether our our in this kind of like here I'm going to count myself as like part of the mainstream archival profession. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, like a white middle-class lady. Um, I hate that word lady so much, but you know, when you say white middle-class lady, it just works together. Um, the, and middle age too, why not? Um, the, the, what am I talking about? Um, yeah, so I'm counting myself as this, as part of this uh, mainstream profession, right? And I think when we think about, when we think about what our role is, we're going to have to think about like, you know, our role maybe isn't taking records right it's 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 not convincing people that that we're a good space to hold their stories maybe it's like sharing some knowledge we have without um i mean we also have as a as a field as a profession we've had a tendency to be very um sure about our ways are right you know like this is what preservation is and this is how you do it um which is not not going to work either. Um, but approaching with some humility, um, our role as uh, as as helpers, as as resources, um, as people who have some expertise to share when we are asked to share it. Um, and maybe we can do things. You know, maybe there are things that mainstream archives can do, like a lot of mainstream archives are really good at writing grants like maybe we can offer grant writing support or something like that right like what are the ways we can support um community community-led um efforts and if the community-led wish is for that material to be in the archival repository in a mainstream archival repository then we can support that too right but i don't think the assumption that i just i feel like the assumption shouldn't be that that the, the repositories that exist now are the best space for all the things they haven't collected over the last hundred and whatever years, right? I don't know, that's maybe not really an answer. That's just kind of me thinking on that. No, I think that was sharing, a good, yeah. great answer. Thank you. So I think that's pretty much the time we have. Thank you so much for coming. This was amazing and I think really, so thank you valuable. for inviting me. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for lending your time and your expertise and your insight to all of this. We're going to um, put this somewhere. I don't know, don't know yet, but um, I know. Is it okay for people oh, to contact sure. you with questions if yeah, there's anything I'm, else? Uh, yeah, and if I don't okay. answer, just email me again because my email is a nightmare. So if you, if you email me and I don't email I you imagine. back in a few days, just email me again. <laughs> yeah okay i will yeah. i'll tell people to follow up well thanks thank so you. much and um have uh, a good thanks. rest of your day thanks everybody for coming and your questions thanks. sure yeah thanks to everyone for coming i really appreciate the, the turnout. Well, thanks this for the awesome. invite jacob and have yeah. a good rest of your afternoon Bye. sure of course